Well, good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, one of my favorite things was the choose your own adventure books. Whenever we had library time, it was the first thing I ran to, this little section in our library. I can still picture it in my mind. This choose your own adventure, and I loved them because there was not only one story, there was multiple stories, and the choices that you could make would reveal a different story. And if you can see it on the screen there, one of these these books has 44 different endings. That would have excited me beyond belief. Uh, I really wish that book was was available when I was a kid. Um, I don't know if these are still a thing, uh, but I think they illustrate something extremely important that our lives are a choose your own adventure, but unfortunately we can't go back and choose something differently. So not to put too much pressure on you, but our choices are really important and they impact how our story will unfold. And so I invite you as we consider this scripture that was just read and the words that I speak to consider how that might shape your story, your life. I want to start with probably a familiar passage in this, in this text that you just heard. This idea of, of God loving a cheerful giver. Now, we might just kind of pass this off as something that we've heard a lot, or maybe we've seen it on the letterhead of, of Christian institutions asking you for money. But it's, it's a really, really important verse because it speaks to the heart and the priorities that we have behind the reasons that we give. I was listening to a set of audio um, recordings of Richard Rohr. Um, he's, he's a father in the Franciscan order and he speaks a lot on spirituality and had some really interesting things to say. Actually, he was, he was supposed to be speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, but it took him four different se- sessions before he could even get to the Sermon on the Mount in setting up what it was all about. And one of the things that I learned here is this idea, if you see in the circle on the screen there, that there are four basic social institutions in our world. There's kinship, you know, our family, extended family, where where we feel belonging. There's religious, so that's, that's where our believing comes in. There's politics, and I don't want to talk about that as partisan politics, but just the way we organize ourselves in our society. And then the fourth is economics, the production and the consumption. Now, do you know which one is primary in our society? Economics. As every uh, crime show addict knows, if you want to find out where people's priority is or who done it, you follow the money. In our culture, we are focused so much on money, and, and we know this because when we look at decisions that are made um, in our homes to all the way up to, to the, the Capitol building, decisions are made based on money. This week, or these past couple weeks, we've seen some crazy things happen in the stock market that I will not try to explain because I don't fully understand. Um, I'm not a money guy, but you know, we're, we're seeing that money has power in our world. And it shapes the way we interact with our world. Um, you know, we're doing, we're doing a finance, or we'll be talking about the budget or later today in our f- annual meeting, so I thought I would use some charts and graphs to kind of acclimatize us to it. This is actually a chart I found in a magazine that I was reading this week, kind of um, fortuitous that it came up. It's an idea that um, the, the Gallup organization did a poll they asked people, is religion an important part of your daily life? And they surveyed 100 countries. And then they looked at those countries and looked at the, let's, let me look at it, the countries per capita income. 
So the idea of, of how much money you make compared with whether you think, as a group, religion is an important part of your daily life. For those in the lowest, the zero to 2,000, 95% said yes, religion is an important part of life, and only 5% said no. If you go down to the bottom, which is where we would fit in, the 25,000 plus, only 47% said yes, and 52% said no. And honestly, I don't think this is much different than Jesus' day, or even before Jesus. Whenever the people of God experienced prosperity, when they were rich, when they were able to do whatever they wanted to do because they had the means to do it, faith took a nosedive. That's when people did whatever they wanted. I also found a quote beside this chart that I thought was very challenging and interesting. Over and over in the article, he used uh, this, this image of Christ knocking at the door. And so in this quote, it reads, when Christ knocks at the door, oh, it disappeared. What happened? When Christ knocks on the door of my material ble- materially blessed heart, the sound of his knocking is muffled. Even when I do hear it, I struggle to climb over all of my blessings to open the door. Sometimes the things that we count as blessings, our financial blessings, our material blessings, can actually get in our way of getting to God. Now, I'm not saying that these things are evil, but there's, there's something more going on. And I think Jesus' message, the children focused on Zacchaeus's, the story of Zacchaeus and Jesus this morning in Sunday school. And that's a great story of, of Jesus turning finances and, and the way we use finances on their head. Jesus helps us to maybe open our hearts and minds to something different, a different way of living and overcoming the priority of greediness. So the answer is why. Why is this important? Why is this needed? I've showed you some data, but there's got to be more to it than that. Well, if you look at the rest of the verses around this very familiar passage of God loves a cheerful giver, you start to see a pattern. Now, in the first part before that, It's this idea of reaping or sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. Now, this is a passage that's also or often misused by prosperity gospel preachers. This idea that if you sow some cash into their pockets, God will reap some cash into yours. That's not a great explanation of this passage. Just want to put that out there. It totally misses the point. The whole idea of sowing generously is this idea that we need to shift our dependence away from the money that we can earn from our ability to produce and consume to God's ability to provide for us. There are a couple passages um, elsewhere in the Bible that really connect with this. Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, it reads, the lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. This is also vanity. And perhaps a more familiar verse from First Timothy, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now, I want to point out here that it doesn't say that money is evil. Money is not the root of all evil. But the love of money is the root of all evil. The money that we have in our bank accounts is just a tool. The money that the church has in its bank account is a tool But how will we use that tool? How will we show our love? How will we experience 
God's interaction with us. So far, this has been a bit of a downer, I realize. But now I want to get into the good stuff. The following verses really help focus on what we can be and where we can go and the goodness that God offers through gratitude and generosity. You see, the rest of the passage that was just read, there's a lot of back and forth describing God's generosity in verses 10 and 11 and 14, our thankfulness for that generosity in verses 11 and 15, and mirroring God's generosity in our lives in verses especially 8 and 9. And that's where I want to focus our our attention right now is, is this passage that's on the screen. And God is able to provide with you every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. So it starts talking about God, but then it actually shifts to us. And the confusing part of this quote that comes next is that they change the pronoun in a way that, confuses, that might confuse us. So this quotation actually comes from Psalm 112, and it's talking about those who are wealthy among God's people. Now again, it's not saying that they are necessarily evil because they're wealthy, but it talks about the way they orient themselves, the way they live their life with their wealth. And so instead of saying, he scatters abroad, he gives it to the poor, his righteousness endures forever, which we might think is referring to God, this passage is actually referring to those who are wealthy. Um, in In the Psalm version of it, it says they. So it's very clear that it's, it's focusing on the people who are wealthy. And actually, I, I love this psalm, and I would really recommend to all of you to look up Psalm 112 sometime. Um, it talks about how happy or blessed are those who revere God. They are wealthy but righteous. They deal generously and with justice. They give freely to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. And then at the very end, it contrasts it with the wicked, those who are provoked to anger by the generosity that that the people of God show, and that they ultimately melt away because their lust for wealth ultimately comes to nothing. You see, in the beginning of this passage, we see that God is sowing generosity. And we reap the benefits of that generosity. And so God then challenges us to to sow that generosity again into those around us. In this way, how we often refer to it as paying it forward. We've received generosity from God, and so we pay it forward with generosity to others. So if I had to boil the message of this passage down to one or two sentences in a way that I think connects with our current situation, I would say it this way. Our wealth can be like a virus that will kill us if we give it a chance. Our only vaccine is practicing gratitude and generosity. Our only vaccine is practicing gratitude and generosity. Our world tells us that we are worth what is in our bank account. We are worth the size of our house or the things that we own. But Jesus offers us another idea. Jesus says we are worth, or our worth is based on our identity as one of God's beloved children. It doesn't matter what you have, It doesn't matter who you are or the title you hold. Kind of like the message last week during children's time and the sermon that Jess preached, it's not about one or two people. It's about being part of this beloved family of God. But like it or not, we all grew up in a world that is focused on this idea of our worth, our personal worth being based on what we can do, 
what we can produce and how much we have. So we have to, we have to find that vaccine. We have to find ways that we can be generous and that we can show gratitude for what we have. But this isn't going to just happen. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as a shot or two in the arm. It's something that we have to do over and over and over again. We have to keep practicing, maybe until it hurts. I have friends who, who are, let's just say, more athletic than I am. And, and I know from their stories that, you know, the first few times you go running is not a great experience. But after you get going and you build up those muscles and build up the sort of strength that you need, it becomes more natural. I've never quite gotten past that initial painful part, if I'm being honest. But this is where we need to build us, ourselves up spiritually through spiritual disciplines that help us towards gratitude and generosity. So in an effort to follow the money in a way that I think reflects these disciplines, I have a few stories that I heard this week. I heard of one couple who, after receiving their, their stimulus checks, actually I've heard several stories of this, have decided to turn around and find ways to give those to others. One does so just by paying for the person behind him in the drive through Another watches for needs and has their ear to the ground for when there's someone or an organization that is specially in need. I heard of another man who um, learned a lesson of generosity over Thanksgiving. Since family, their families had to be separate, um, he drove to his daughter's house, picked up the, the meal that had been prepared and was going to go back to eat this, this Thanksgiving dinner with his wife. But on his way back, he had to get some gas, and he, and he realized that there was somebody there that was in great need. And so even though he had been smelling and like anticipating this meal, he decided to give it to this family in need. And even though he only had six dollars in his wallet, he gave what he could. But he, he also reflected in that story that he wished he had done more. And that's what I find humbling. I'm thinking like, oh, you gave away this beautiful meal and all your cash, albeit not much. But he was like, I wish I had, I had offered them a hotel room to pay for a hotel room for a couple nights. Sometimes our first impulse doesn't take us quite as far as we wish it would. This last story is one that I think is pretty powerful because it, it, it kind of goes from, from this place of very wealth-building mentality to a more generous mentality. This person I know was saving about 20% of their income for their retirement. But when they were kind of looking at their budget and figuring things out, they realized they were actually only giving away 5%. This weighed on them greatly. And so they just decided, with some hard work and some reallocation, that it was more important to them spiritually to be in a good place, and to have those two be balanced, and found a way to balance it at about 12% each. I think this is especially a powerful story because it illustrates the generosity that is truly a spiritual discipline probably costs us something. It's not just the change we find in our couch. It's not just what we have left at the end of the month. Some people call it first fruits giving. You give from your first paycheck of the month. Some will do it where they just have it set up so that it comes out of their account, no matter what status their account is set at. 
based on their income. I think if we have any hope of overcoming our dependence on money, on wealth as our defining worth, then we have to do something in a way that hurts a little. We have to, like the runner, feel the pain for a few days before it becomes natural. The last part of this passage that I want to focus on connects directly with our church. Well, it didn't back then, but I'm going to make the connection now. When Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, if we look back a chapter, we realize that in a lot of ways, this, this letter that he wrote to them, or at least this part of the letter, was a little bit like one of those um, letters asking for, for money. It's a fundraising letter. He talks about the Macedonians who, even though they're poor, have given generously. Macedonia being a place that was nowhere near as wealthy as Corinth, had given huge amounts of funds, sacrificially giving. And so Paul writes to the church in Corinth saying, you're a huge city full of wealth. Certainly you can give too. Because not only is it important to our spiritual lives that we are people of generosity, but it's also important to keep the ministries of the church going. Churches typically do not receive funds from anywhere else but from within. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'm a very good fundraiser. That's not what I feel is my calling. I know there are people in the church that are. But what I can tell you, I think, is what I do and what I believe. Every month, I have my automatic debit set up to come out of my bank account. This is roughly 10% of my income that I give to Heston Mennonite. And much like Lamar was saying, there's sometimes giving that goes above that, but it's important to me to support the ministries and the work of Heston Mennonite Church. Not just because that ensures my paycheck, but because of these three reasons. First, I think that the church is important. I am passionate about the church for many, many reasons. Not just the church at large, but the local church. And not just the local church, but Heston Mennonite Church. I have chosen to be a part of this congregation, and I think that comes with the responsibility of supporting and giving. Second reason, I see value in the ministries that happen here. Not just what they produce, but for whom they support. Our ministries support children and youth, both from within, you know, the families that are connected to our church, but also families that are not. We've helped people from our neighborhood that have very little connection from our congregation. We've also partnered with organizations like MCC and Mennonite Mission Network, Care Portal, and the Amani Church of Wichita. Third, and perhaps most selfishly, I'll admit, I know that if, if I don't feel the sort of loss of these funds, I risk spiritual poverty. And now, sure, I could use those extra thousands of dollars that are given every year for a vacation, maybe a new phone or iPad or other shiny thing. But I know that it's important for me to resist. It's important for me to push back against the impulse that says, consume, 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 mine, mine, mine. And so I've decided for me, 
It's important because of my value for church, my value for the ministries here, and my value to grow spiritually into a spiritual richness that I give to the church. Now, I don't want this to be about me. I'm telling you this because I think it's important that we're willing to be honest and vulnerable about how we spend our money. I'll also admit that I spend money on all kinds of other things too. And if you come by my house, you'll see no shortage of Bluetooth devices and Alexa dots. But without this giving that has become a part of my life, I know that I would live a much more spiritually impoverished, impoverished way. So I invite you to consider what this might look like for you. And I want to point out, and this is not a commercial here, but we do have a great resource in our local Everance office that is just in North Newton and on their website. There are great tools on there for budgeting, for financial planning, for now and for the future. And I'm sure there are many other organizations that do that and I don't want to just focus too much on Everance, but I know that I've been blessed by the way that they not only focus on, on generosity, but help to focus on this, the faith aspect of that. And I'll also say I know they're not perfect. I've butted heads with a fair number of folks over there about different ways of doing things, but it is a resource that's out there that's connected with our faith uh, tradition and our faith stream. And so I encourage you to look into that or to look elsewhere. Try to find ways that you can connect this idea of spiritual wealth that is not based on our money. So this afternoon, we're going to have a business meeting. We're going to talk about where we've been and where we're going. And a lot of that will have to do with money. But we have to remember that money is simply a tool. It's not something that we love. It's not something we worship. We're here to worship God and God alone. And we use the tool of money. We use the tool of this facility. We use the tool of our live stream and the technology that goes into that so that we may engage in the ministries of Heston Mennonite Church, of South Central Conference, of Mennonite Church USA, and far beyond. May we find ways to use our wealth, our power, our privilege to serve God for the glory of God as we are called to be stewards of God's creation on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.